man who was severely depressed because he wasn't getting ahead, told his wife that life was without purpose. What do you mean you have nothing to live for, she replied. The house isn't paid for, the car isn't paid for, the furniture isn't paid for, you've got a lot of things yet to do. <laughs> All too often, the ones who make the difference that we can hold on to are the ones who don't listen to those voices of gloom and doom that are always around us and always ready to sing their song, their chant, that it's all going downhill, that it's all going south, that we're not able to resist it. We look ahead and we keep on going. I love the story of little frogs. Once upon a time, there was a bunch of tiny frogs who arranged a running competition. The goal was to reach the top of a very high tower. Big crowd gathered around that tower to see the race and to cheer on the contestants. The race began, but no one in the crowd really believed that those tiny frogs could ever reach the top of that tower. You heard statements such as, oh, the way is way too difficult. They'll never make it to the top. Not a chance. They won't succeed. That tower is too high. They don't have the strength nor the ability. They just can't do it. Tiny frogs began collapsing one by one, except for those who, in a fresh tempo, were climbing higher and higher. The crowd continued to yell, it's too difficult, no one will make it, no one has ever made it. More tiny frogs higher and gave up, but one continued higher and higher and higher. He just wouldn't give up. At the end, everyone else had given up climbing the tower, except for that one tiny frog who, after a big effort, finally reached the top. All the other tiny frogs wanted to know how in the world this one frog managed to do it. A contestant asked the tiny frog how he found the strength to succeed to reach that goal. It turned out that that tiny frog was deaf. He couldn't hear all those, you can't do it, you won't make it. It's often possible for persons to be more clear-eyed in disaster than in prosperity. Isn't it remarkable that some of the most noble and courageous passages we find in all of Scripture came during the Babylonian captivity when the Jews seemed to have no chance, yet there were a few who saw God's call and claim upon them, who wouldn't believe that it was over, who had turned a deaf ear to all those chants of doom, remarkable that Lincoln's Gettysburg Address is often called the most noblest speech in all of America. It came during the darkness of the Civil War when victory seemed to be only a dream. There are times of greatest joy. Those times come when we not only don't listen to the voices of doom and gloom, but we are able to focus on the voice of Almighty God who says, I have come to give you power from within. There's something about dark times that can inspire our most profound thoughts. The reality of the important questions of life, the Apostle Paul expressed this in a reality when he wrote to the letter to the Romans. We can boast about looking forward to God's glory, he says, but that is not all we can boast about. We can boast about our suffering. These sufferings bring patience, as we know, and pray patience brings perseverance, and perseverance brings hope. And this hope is not deceptive, because the love of God has been poured into our hearts by the power of the Holy Spirit, which has been given to us. We will make it somehow, some way, by God's grace, we will be more than conquerors through him who proved his love for us. Christian joy isn't pie in the sky. It isn't wishful thinking. Peter and Paul are not Pollyannas, neither is Jesus. We don't need the gospel to tell us that life is a struggle, but we do need the gospel to tell us what the struggle is all about. Why we are working so hard at trying to be faithful, at caring for each other, at making a difference in the world. We're doing it because that's what God created us to do that we will only find meaning and purpose for our own existence when we touch the hem and the garment of Jesus Christ.
Christ. And we come to realize that as he washed the disciples' feet, he is calling all of us to wash each other's feet and to care for the world in his name. Psychologist Eric, Eric Fromm says that people are distinguished by whether they are death-oriented or life-oriented. But the roots of the difference are more than psychological. They spring from a deep level of our being, where we decide to adjust as comfortably as possibly as things as they are, and that is death-oriented. Or to work as wholeheartedly as possible for things as they ought to be, and that's life-oriented. And that's what you and I are called by God to, to do and to be every time we pray, Oh Lord, may your kingdom come to earth as it is in heaven. That's how things ought to be, and we are a part of allowing that to happen. Use us, Lord.